Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran taking the opportunity during COVID to organize your ADAT tapes, or else a scrappy upstart, using the pandemic to alphabetize your EDM sets in Dropbox, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey guys, it's the third Friday of June 2020. I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for being here. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle, built by musicians and for musicians. Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I am old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Wilhelm who drove a Mazda 6 and had a long-sleeved t-shirt with a picture of Morpheus offering the red pill on it. And old Wilhelm would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in about six months. It's the future now. We have nice things now. We don't have to deal with the Wilhelms of the world anymore. You guys, we have Banzoogle. Uh, Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. It has everything. Hosting and a custom domain name, Dozens of fully customizable design templates, social media integrations, the ability to crowdfund commission-free. It's a great, great service. Uh, The Working Songwriter podcast listeners can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Just use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming months, I will be streaming live on my YouTube channel for something called The Song Show on Sunday, June 28th at 9 p.m. Eastern. So just head on over to YouTube, search for Joe Pug, follow my channel there, and then on Sunday, June 28th, I will be playing a bunch of songs live at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that it, it allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you love. Uh, you just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter or you search for my name. And then you sign up to kick in a few bucks a month for every show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription. Um, if even just 1% of our listenership kicked in the price of a cup of coffee, it would make a huge difference for me. So thanks for all of you that have already done that. If you're not in a place to contribute financially, I get that. I've been there. Uh, There's still a couple things that you could do for free that would help me out. Uh, Firstly, you could leave me a rating in the iTunes store. Um, That would be awesome. Just click on the podcast, sign up to leave a good review. Or secondly, you could just tell a like-minded friend who you think would dig this show. Spread the word. Uh, The simple math on those last two things is that they will help me much more then they will be a pain in the ass for you. Um, I'll end the harassment there. Pete and I have been friends for years now. He took me on a very long tour uh, supporting his band about a half decade ago, and we've remained in touch ever since. He's putting out a new solo album now, apart from Devil Makes Three, so this seemed like the perfect time to catch up and hear about his journey so far. Our guest this month is the primary songwriter behind The Devil Makes Three, a bluegrass, folk, and old-time music institution that plays to sold-out theaters around the U.S. and abroad. Pete Bernard began his musical journey with childhood friend Cooper McBean, and they eventually brought into the fold bass player Lucia Torino. They pounded the pavement playing shows out of Santa Cruz, California for nearly a decade before they burst onto the national scene with their album Do Wrong Right, in 2009. They've recorded for Milan and New West Records. They've toured with Social Distortion, Old Crow Medicine Show, and have even supported Willie Nelson and Alison Krauss. 
They've appeared at Outside Lands Festival, Austin City Limits, and Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival. Saving Country Music has said of them that few bands carry the longevity and legacy of The Devil Makes Three. An American songwriter has said of their last album, change is essential if a group is to survive and artistically grow, and for them, the risk has paid off. Just last week, Pete had enough time to catch up with me and spend a little bit of time with our plucky little podcast. Well, Pete from Devil Makes Three, thanks so much for joining our show today. Um, I want to start just by asking about your origin story. You're a band with Devil Makes Three. All of you are rural New Englanders. You play Appalachian punk music, and your band started in Santa Cruz, California. That's a hell of an origin uh, to begin with. Yeah, can, can you talk wacky. about the early years there? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, we all are from the same area. Actually, me and uh, Lucia live here in Vermont. Cooper lives in Austin, Texas now, which I think you already know. Um, but yeah, he uh, he's down there. We we all grew up in Vermont, and me and Cooper ended up going out west with you know dreams of uh, playing music when we were pretty young separately. I went out. Well, actually, wow, I moved to California when I was fairly young. I was playing music by myself. I started out playing, you know, like I guess playing out when I was a teenager, you know, playing open mics and stuff like that. And uh, eventually ended up going to Nashville to live with my brother um, in the 90s. And after that, me and Cooper both ended up in Olympia, Washington. And uh, we started playing as a duo. And we then went on a tour I think that should probably be put in quotation marks. I don't know what some of your early tours were like, but basically it was two guys driving around in a car. Um, we did have some shows, but, I mean, it was uh, dubious to call it a tour. We might, have, we might have paid our gas money. Right. And we had a, we had a lot of fun, too. Uh, and we went down to California, and we, we actually ended up breaking down in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm pretty sure we were in a pickup truck, and... We broke down in Santa Cruz, and our friend Lucia was living there at the time, and uh, she had recently stopped going to school at UC Santa Cruz, and um, we borrowed her uh, her car in order to finish the tour and go down to Texas, and um, we accidentally drove it off the road somewhere in Bisbee, Arizona, which ran over a really big rock. Luckily, nothing went wrong, and the radio started working again, so... It was a success story. And when we came back, we realized that um, Olympia is really terrible in the wintertime. The weather's just brutal. And uh, Lucia encouraged us to move to Santa Cruz, and we started the band. I mean, it's just very, very odd and long story. Yeah. Uh, what kind of music were you playing with Cooper at the time doing that duo tour? Oh, it was really similar. Folk music. Um, you know, I was writing the songs, uh, and Cooper was doing, like, playing lead, and, uh, you know, he hadn't really started, I think he was playing tenor banjo at the time, he hadn't started playing five-string yet. Um, yeah, it was really similar, maybe more, more folky, um, slower, you know. Where, where the uh, hell did you guys learn how to play that music in kind of a pre-internet world? I mean, you kind of see it. You guys have started like the vanguard. So many people know about the music now because of you guys playing it and other people in your scene. But, I mean, I didn't know a lot of people that knew about music like that back in, you know, 2001, 2002. How did you figure out how to play it? Well, you know, I mean, like a lot of people, like you probably with whoever, you know, your first records, we, we learned a lot from the records, you know, mm-hmm. um, by listening and learning. And Cooper was way into that at that time, too. He was just like hitting it really hard and, and he would learn a song and I would learn the song from him and vice versa and stuff like that. But also a big part of it was our parents. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Cooper's mom was a singer. We used to, I used to go watch her sing with my aunt. Um, in, in the bars when I was a kid, and um, his dad was in a band. My dad was a guitar player. My brother was a guitar player. My uncle, like I said, my aunt was a folk singer. So they kind of like introduced us to a lot of um, blues and folk music 
uh, and that was kind of the start of it. it. Was really our family's. I'd say our family's record collection was the beginning of it. And I got introduced to a lot of blues music and a lot of folk music early on. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, no one I knew really. Well, I mean, I guess I knew folk musicians, and they played some of these traditional, more traditional songs. And then the rest was just, you know, <laughs> sitting there listening to records over and over and over again. Yeah, that's a trip, man, because it, it's you're so kind of far outside of culture, the culture of that time to be listening to records like those. I mean, everything then was, you know, grunge and, you know, the big the big bang after Nirvana. And that's what everyone was going after at that time. And you and Cooper seem like uh, kind of men out of out of time there. Yeah, it was really weird. I think we were really kindred spirits in a way because, like, me and Cooper, we were really into punk music as well. And uh, there was something, you know, there's definitely something about um, listening to all that old music uh, that was, I don't know, that felt kind of weirdly punk rock. It was like, no, no, not that many people did it. Um, there was a connection between the sort of punk world and the rockabilly music world as well. We used to drive around in his like old Toyota Tercel and smoke cigarettes and listen to like you know oldies basically like early rock and roll um, and I don't know why we both really liked that stuff so much um, but we did you know and even when I was like twelve you know or thirteen years old I mean I got got introduced to that music and I just loved it it was like you're saying it was totally not cool um, I uh, you know my friends were really into metal. Like metal was really big yeah. at that time. Um, you know, they were into like Metallica and Megadeth, Sepultura, Slayer, and and I was like trying to learn these like finger picking blues songs. <laughs> it was definitely not. It wasn't like I wasn't winning the popularity contest. But uh, luckily, you know, I mean, I met Cooper, and he was into the same kind of stuff, and, and you know, God knows why. And we, yeah, we started playing together pretty early on. You know what I think might be similar between that the punk ethos and the folk ethos is is here's what they have in common when I think about it. If I want to be in like a famous rock band or, or something like that, that means I have to go to Los Angeles or New York or Chicago maybe and get signed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Get taken to the top. Whereas if you want to start a punk band or you want to start you know being a folk musician and playing gigs, you can start that night in your hometown. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's really true. Um, I've had that conversation with a lot of people, and I think that's that's one of the great things about it is that you can do it anywhere. Like, you know, some of the bands that you know that that I loved, you know, came from absolutely some of the crappiest places, and it just didn't matter at all. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's because it was the whole the whole um, uh, like culture surrounding it was about doing it yourself and doing it with your friends and doing your own thing, not not relying on other people's help. Yeah. You know, there's a really famous story from Richard Pryor. This might be apocryphal. I don't know if it happened or not, but he had a new manager and the new manager spent an hour telling him about all these plans for world domination and their five-year plan and how they were going to put it into effect and make him really famous. And he finished and then Pryor said, that's cool. What are we going to do tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> You know, exactly. It, I think, it, it yeah. seems like, you know, when I think about your career and the way that it's just naturally progressed from that point in Vermont to where it is now and you're, you know, you're touring the world with, with you know, a devoted fan base, it just, everything seems to like make sense to me. It, it's a very natural outgrowth of what are we doing tomorrow? What can we do tonight in Vermont, you know? Yeah, and I think that that's the way that we always approached it, and and I mean it's the way that uh, that worked for us. You know, I mean everybody has a different approach to the whole thing, and um, I think you know having having sort of uh, you know grown up, um, you know being somewhat in the punk scene, that was a big part of it too. Was just sort of you know finding your own way to do it, and yeah, doing what was the what you were going to do that week, that month you know, in six months. That's as far as we ever went. (laughs) Got it. Got it. So take me back to you've, you've done, you've stolen uh, Lucia's car to go on the rest of your tour. You bring it back to return it to her. What happens then? When do you guys, do you stick around Santa Cruz and decide you're going to be a band? Do you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was hard not to, because it was so, so beautiful there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We pretty much, uh, we came back to Santa Cruz, uh, 
like, I guess, directly. We went back to uh, Olympia, packed up our stuff, came back to Santa Cruz, and we were playing again, just me and Cooper. We had our friend Jackie, who actually um, I was recently in touch with. He went on our first tour to Europe with us, and he... He played bass with us on the early stuff. He wrote some of our early bass lines, but he was also in a lot of other bands. And Lucia, you know, showed up and was like, hey, I've got time, and if you teach me how to play the bass, I can play. And we were like, okay. And Cooper actually taught Lucia, their, you know, her early um, bass, like, licks, but pretty soon she was, you know, playing past him, and he stopped. And that was that was basically that. Yeah, we all lived together, and we all played together multiple places in Santa Cruz and yeah that was it I mean I had no idea that we were what we were doing at the time you know what was there a, a larger music scene going on there in Santa Cruz at the time or, or were you guys kind of outliers uh there was definitely a larger music scene for sure uh, for such a small town I was I was impressed um you know there was uh there wasn't a lot for what we were doing um, as you can imagine, I mean, like you say, it's not a super popular style um, out there. Uh, there wasn't a lot of people doing that, but there was a pretty big music scene. There was a lot of bands at the time. There was a lot of punk bands. I mean, you're pretty close to San Francisco as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we we were part of a... I mean, the scene was incredibly supportive, too. Like, it was amazing. You know, people were... People really loved the local bands there, and people were you know, really wanted to help them, and there was a really great community of artists and musicians and radio DJs, and yeah, it was really supportive. That, that's a great thing. Do, I think I remember you telling me on it, you took me on a very long tour once, and I think I remember on that you told me that very early on, you guys kind of crossed paths with uh, Todd Snyder when he came to town. Oh, yeah, man, that was our first tour. I absolutely love Todd. Um, yeah, it was like our first real tour. It's funny to think about all this stuff that's so long ago, but I, uh, we'd never really been out of California. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, California's pretty big, and <laughs> we were a young band, and so we were touring a lot, but we weren't really leaving the state. We might go into Oregon a little bit, um, but, you know, not much more than that. And yeah, our, for one of our first tours um, was with Todd Snyder and Robert O'Keen, and we went down to Texas. Oh, wow. How'd and, that come about? Oh, man. It came about because of our first um, a guy that we worked with in Santa Cruz that you might know named John Sandage. Mm-hmm. And John uh, uh, had a radio show on um, K-Pig. And we played the K-Pig Swine Soiree, which was uh, basically a music festival that they used to put on outside of Santa Cruz. I don't know. It had many names over the years. Uh, but Todd was uh, headlining that festival. Mm-hmm. And we ended up through John, he suggested that we go on the road with Todd, and we were like, oh, that sounds great. And uh, Todd was playing Double Bill with Robert O'Keefe, and that was uh, that was our first tour outside of California. It was a ton of fun. Also, we were totally unprepared for it, so it was, it was pretty hard. <laughs> Wait, when you say unprepared, do you mean like musically on stage, or do you mean like just knowing how to tour for longer amounts of time? Or both. I think it was more the knowing how to tour thing. We were we were overjoyed to be on stage. I mean mm-hmm. that part was great. You know we were playing to uh, you know the uh, great crowd every night, and um, Todd was awesome. Robert Elkin was awesome. We were just excited to be there. But the traveling part, no, we were not ready for that. We 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 were not ready to go through Texas in the summer in our ancient van, which overheated if you went over 40 miles an hour. We were, it was just, we were not really prepared for the kind of touring that you do when you're, um, when you're following a bus, you know? Yeah. Um, it was hard. And uh, the van broke down a lot. We actually broke down in Austin. Um, and my friend Michael fixed the van, but I mean, it was, it was an adventure for sure. I, I, we learned that, you know, touring um the way that robert and todd were was a different thing you know and that's actually a really great first bigger tour for you guys to go on because that would almost become the blueprint like to me you guys play songwriter music but to a crowd that wants to come and have a hell of a time you know what you know what i mean and that's that is what todd and uh robert earl Earl king when i think of them it's a very similar situation really detailed lyrical songs but with a crowd that comes to want to fucking party man 
Yeah, I know. It was really a great. Uh, I really got a hand to sleep to John there. He uh, helped us out on that one. It was a great. It was a great pair up, and um, and then because of that, you know, we ended up playing with Todd later on, and um, you know, and hanging out with him and getting to know him some. It was it was an awesome uh, introduction to basically, yeah, Texas. Arizona, New Mexico. Todd is—he's been a longtime friend of mine, and I, I actually just got to tape to tape an episode of this show with him, and it was amazing to hear him talk about his, the way that he thinks about performing. Like, I don't know what it is like for you, but for me, I always kind of want to know what's going to happen in the show, and I want things as much as possible to be under my control, and this, that, and the other. And Todd just doesn't kind of work like that, and he doesn't work like that on purpose. Yeah, I know. I'd say I'm way more of of your school. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, I sort of want to know what's going to happen and plan it out, and you know, ha- have a plan. Um, as you know, it you know, it doesn't always work. <laughs> sure. uh, sometimes things don't go as planned. But yeah, I know that very well from uh, from playing with Todd. That he's just more of a sort of like you know, let what happens happens kind of guy. And uh, I, you know, I think that's a. I actually read something Todd said in an interview one time that was like, you know, I like to uh, surprise myself, and sometimes that means that uh, I don't even show up for the gig. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds about right. God bless the man. Uh. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, I I, I definitely have always been more your approach, and, you know, sometimes things go wrong and you've got to improvise. But I I know that very well about Todd. He... he, um, he likes to to do it fast and loose, and it's what makes it great. I think there's an element of fear. Yeah, yeah, and the audience can feel that he's. I saw him play a festival in Colorado once, and I don't think I'm talking out of school here because he's talked openly about this before. He he drank some mushroom tea uh, mm-hmm. before he went on stage, and I mean, you're just witnessing this guy who's on stage, and he's just this vibrating filament right there, present. You don't know if the show is going to work or not. You, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's and very it, I gotta say it's incredibly punk rock and at the end of it he just went and started taking all like the band's gear he was taking like harmonicas and cables and giving it away to the audience and the band was just kind of like what the fuck man <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's also part of, uh, you know, that's part of his thing. It's like you, you show up and you don't know what you're going to get. And I've always been, um, you know, I've always been more of like, yeah, your your approach to things of like, yeah, you know, I want to know what I'm doing and and how it's going to all play out, you know, and, 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 uh, and hopefully it does. I mean, but, you know, I think that I think that Todd's uh, approach is very brave. I do, too. Yeah, yeah, no, I wish I had the stones to do it, to be honest. Um, now, yeah. Was that tour then, with them, you get your first national tour, you learn how to take out a van that's not going to break down for you every three days. Um, was that a springboard for you guys to sort of a, a larger touring life, or did you stay in Santa Cruz for a while longer? What what kind of brought you to national prominence? What, what was the dividing line between that era and what you guys do now? Well, that was definitely the beginning for us. You know, it was like, it was after that, we were like, wow, there's really something, you know, this is something we could do, you know, Um, which is always an amazing feeling for for any musician, you know. Um, But afterwards, no, we stayed in Santa Cruz for the next, I mean, you know, around 10 years we were in California. um, And we toured... I guess after that is when we started to push out more. You know, like I said, we'd never left California. We started to do, you know, to go back where we were with Todd to go to, to you know, to go to Texas and to go to Arizona, go to New Mexico. And then we went to Washington. We started to push out. You know, we went into Montana. And we sort of did. That was when we sort of started touring that half of the country, you mm-hmm. know. And um, after that was when we realized, yeah, this is... This could be our job. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is a beautiful realization. That's probably the best realization you have in your life right there. It was really great, you know, and we still, I mean, sometimes I, I still am like, I can't even believe we we did that. You know what I mean? It, it's like, it's it seems unreal. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was definitely the beginning. That was the beginning of it. I know what you mean that it seems unreal. Like when I think about how my life played out, I look back and I'm like, man, if I run this scenario of me trying to do this a hundred times, this probably doesn't work out like 98 of the times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, seems, 
it seems implausible, but I think you know anybody who's a songwriter, anybody who's a who is a touring musician, and and it has done it successfully. I mean, there's just an element of of working really hard or potentially being too crazy to give up. I think it's a it's a equal parts of the two. You know. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. When could you feel it really starting to snowball? Because there's a difference between, you know, uh, learning that you can make a living and, and, you know, it looks pretty good and we'll split the money as a band and it's cool to, you know, by the time I was touring with you guys, you're playing two sold out Fox theaters in Oakland. Maybe it was three. I can't even remember at this point. When did it start to snowball to a point where you were like, wow, this is taking on like a life of its own here? Well, you know, it all happened really incrementally for us. You know what I mean? It was like every time we'd play, there'd be a couple more people, to be honest with you. And it just happened really, really, you know, naturally. Um, you know, we, we just, uh, we sort of just kind of hung in there. We played and we played and we played and we played, you know, and eventually, I mean, there was definitely some points at which I was like, wow, this is, you know, amazing. I mean, we, we played, we, we played, um, Red Rocks with Shaky Graves. And that was like a, wow, this is like, I've never done a show like this before in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and there were definitely moments like that, you know, where we, where we really were like, Oh man, this is something we never thought we'd be able to do. But we always kind of kept that attitude, you know, like when we were starting out and, you know, we, we thought it would be great to have, you know, 50 people come to the show. And then, you know, when we had a hundred, that was a surprise and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like, it all seemed like, um, like wow this is cool you know i I didn't didn't see it coming and that's sort of how we kept kept moving forward there was no moment where we were like oh my you know holy shit it's actually happening i think it was probably too though because we were just working too hard we we honestly weren't paying attention (laughs) yeah You heard Pete talk about the music his parents raised him on and how different it was from the popular culture that he grew up in. I've always respected artists who have blazed a path toward their own voice, whether they thought that there would be an audience there to listen to it or not. And in the long run for Pete, it turned out that there was an audience there. But he never could have known that starting out. It would have been much more convenient, much more expedient for him to pursue a voice that was much more in tune with current trends. The times in my life where I've been guided by expediency rather than authenticity have always produced the worst fruit. Here's a poem by Polish poet Czeslo Milas that talks about that kind of cheap expediency entitled Account. The history of my stupidity would fill many volumes. Some would be devoted to acting against consciousness, like the flight of a moth which, had it known, would have tended nevertheless toward the candle's flame. Others would deal with ways to silence anxiety, the little whisper which, though it is a warning, is ignored. I would deal separately with satisfaction and pride, the time when I was among their adherents who strut victoriously, unsuspecting. But all of them would have one subject, desire, if only my own, but no, not at all. Alas, I was driven because I wanted to be like others. I was afraid of what was wild and indecent in me. The history of my stupidity will not be written. For one thing, it's late, and the truth is laborious. What is it like to keep together, uh, you know, the three of you, Cooper and Lucia, what is it like to keep a creative partnership going for a couple decades? I mean, it, that's always struck me as really hard because not only do you have to agree creatively on stuff, but there's just the nuts and bolts of things of like, you know, how many dates a year are we going to tour? And all three people who have three different life situations have to agree on what you're going to do. How do you keep a 
a partnership like that going over the course of many, many years? Well, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say it's easy. You know, it's definitely very difficult. And it's like, I always think about it like it's a family. You know what I mean? And like, sometimes, you know, family can be difficult. Um, But I think it has to be, it has to be like a family. You know, it's the only way for for it to work. You know, it's like you, you, like with your friends, you can like have a falling out, but you never really fall out with your family. And uh, that's kind of, I think that's the only way. It's the only way that it can work, you know? And, I mean, it is difficult. I mean, people, the thing is, too, it's like people change, and your life expectations change, and, you know, people get married, and people get divorced, people have children. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know what I mean? Life changes. It's just it's just a reality of it. Um, and, you know, it is difficult, and I think a huge part of it is just being able to compromise, you know? I mean, it's hugely about compromise. It's like... And, you know, that's something that's hard to, it's a lesson hard learned. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but, you know, like, sometimes you just want to do what you want to do. You know, like, you have a plan, and you want to, like, execute that plan. And as you probably know, being in a band, you know, it's like, well, only if everybody else wants to. (laughs) Right, right. Well, you know, no, see, I have it totally different, because I've always done it, you know, basically on my own, because I've had such a hard time. Uh, relenting any of that control. But at the same time, I feel like that, in some ways, that's really creatively held me back because I think something really special happens when three people create something together. When when you all are faced in the same direction, trying to serve the same higher good creatively, there's undeniably something that happens um, that is greater than what one person can um, achieve. So it, I think it's a grass is greener type situation. I mean, it's, it's great for me because I... I get to decide when and where I'm going to tour, you know, anytime. It doesn't, you know, that's, that's my decision to make or how the record's going to go. But at the same time, I do miss being pushed um, by other people and learning from other people. Right. Yeah. I guess that's the trade off. That's know? the trade off I mean, right there. That's definitely the trade off. Because I, I think you're right. You know, there's chemistry in a band and it, it does, you know, affect. It's like a band is, is a people coming together and making some different music, you know, and, uh, and it wouldn't be the same if you were just doing it on your own. And I mean, I think that that's, that's the cool part of it. You know what I mean? The, the hard part of it is, yeah, sort of balancing everybody's different personalities, everybody's different lifestyle choices, you know, what, what people want and don't want. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, do you, are you, I mean, I guess for both of us, we're, we're like unemployed currently, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but normally, I mean, are you on the road a lot? Let's, like, no, how much see, you- it, it all changed for me. I So that year that I toured with you, which would have been in 2015, you guys had me come out and support about a month or two. And mm-hmm. uh, that was my biggest year touring ever. I, I toured a lot, a lot, a lot. And then that year I did like 200 dates. But then at the end of that year, I got married uh, to my longtime partner, uh, Jamie, and then we, we started a family together. So that was like my biggest year. I kept on pushing, pushing, and pushing, trying to get it to break through to like another side. And then mm-hmm. when it didn't, I was like, well, cool. I still have like a job here. I can still make a living here, but I'm going to start prioritizing being at home more because I, I ran into like an opposite problem that you guys had. You mentioned, you know, we come, there's 50 people, then there's 100, then there's 300, then there's 600. For me, it would be more like, okay, first there's 100. Oh, hey, there's 300 at this hometown show. That's awesome. Okay, next time there's 150. Okay, now there's two. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, it kind of stayed in this place where it didn't feel like it was going one way or the other, no matter how much I toured. So I was mm-hmm. like, well, hey, if it's just going to stay here, then I'll tour a little bit less. And so now I do about, mm, I'll tour about 70 shows per year is what I do. Oh, that sounds very relaxing. Oh, dude, it's it is. It isn't, it's yeah. the promised land, brother. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah, it definitely sounds amazing. You guys are yeah, more in like the hundred and twenty five, hundred and fifty. Yeah, because yeah, as you know, we 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 do a lot more than that. But I mean, not that much. I mean, even even just thinking about your your year of of two hundred dates a year, it's like, oh man, I don't want to do that much, you know. No. Um, but but I mean I know what it's like for sure. Yeah, I mean you know that's a big part of the band element too. Is yeah, some people are wanting to do seventy dates, some people want to do twenty, some people want to do two fifty. It's it's really tough to to balance it out. And um, yeah, we've we've definitely struggled with that, and we still do. And I mean, right now you know we're like I said in this in this sort of like um, 
break period, which I got to admit, I mean, you know, uh, as much as I miss playing, it has been nice to sort of uh, be able to think about it a little bit. You know what yes. I mean? And and have those conversations of like, hey, wait a minute, how much do we want to do? You know, what, what would be, what, what does look good? Because when you're just working and putting your head down, you don't really think about it at all, or at least I don't. Yeah, I've I've kind of thought about it as, okay, well, I know that I want touring to be a part of my creative life because it's so fun to tour the country. It's so fun to see people and mix it up, bring the songs to people. It's great. Um, but how about I don't have to do, you know, where it gets to be a real bummer is when you're just out there to punch a paycheck. Because there's, mm-hmm. there's easier ways to make money than, you know, playing Orlando on a Wednesday night, uh, mm-hmm. you know. So I think what I'm learning from this pandemic time, it's like, all right, well, let me, there's obviously other ways to bring in revenue streams creatively um, that don't involve me being out. Let me build those up. And then when I go out to tour, how about it's I'm going out to tour because it's going to be a great experience, you know, like. Here's a really cool bill with a couple bands that we've put together, and it's going to be really special. It'll never happen again. And let's take that to people and have a great time. I think that's a really good approach. You know what I mean? I think I think it's a really great approach, and and I think like that's the way it should be. You know what I mean? And you should be out there because you want to be out there, and you should be out there with bands you like and or friends you want to be with or whatever. And you know, I think I think too that that translates to the crowd. And that's why, you know, we've always made a point of trying to, you know, yeah, play with people that we really like, you know, have have bands that we have a connection to, not yes. just a random person that, you know, a manager wants on the bill or whatever, you right. know, to try and actually be like, hey, the reason we're with this band is because we think they're great. I mean, that was like how we ended up with um, Todd Snyder all those years ago. He basically was like, hey, who are these guys? Hey, you know, do you want to come with me? And we were like, hell yeah, we do. That's great. You know, and that's what we've always tried to do too is is be like, hey, we like what you're doing and we want you to come out with us because it's, it really does, you know, change the whole experience. It's like, it's, it's different. It's like all of a sudden, you know, you get to see somebody you like every night, um, which is great. It also, I think, pushes you. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, man, they put on such a great show. I want to make sure I put on a great show. And I think that the musicians feed off of that. Yes. It's, it's a great thing. You know, it's really good when it works. You've described a little bit of what it's like to work with creative partners and, and compromise on the more logistical side of things. What is it like to work with creative partners and compromise on the creative side of things? How has that worked for you and the band um, over the years? Well, I mean, we have a weird system in, in my band. I mean, it's it's worked. It, to be honest with you, it's, it's worked better and better. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, like, I write... You know, the majority of the material, you know, Cooper has written a couple songs, you know, on, on each record pretty much. Um, and, you know, I rate the rest of the songs. And the way we the way we approach it has been pretty cut and dry, and it's worked really well. I mean, it's sort of like I'll come with the lyrics and the guitar part, and mm-hmm. then we sort of do the arrangement and the harmonies and, of course, the leads and stuff. Uh, or the drums, if there are drums, or, you know, whatever, as a band. So that part of it's way more kind of like an open creative process of, like, arranging and parts and harmonies and stops, whatever. Um, and the rest of it's kind of up to me. And so it's it's kind of been like um two-part process, you know. It's my job to come up with the song, and it's it's their job to come up with their their part of it, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's singing or uh, playing banjo or bass or, or an idea for changing, you know, the arrangements of the songs or whatever. And it's been pretty good because we don't, we don't really have like a, you know, like a, like a two songwriter kind of a thing. You know, we don't really have a lot of battles, like creative battles in our group. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think more, you know, what's been difficult and what can be difficult is just dealing with the stress, you know, whether you're making a record or you're doing a really long tour that maybe doesn't make any money or whatever, you know, all the pitfalls of being a musician. I think that's the part that's really tough. Creatively, we've had our struggles, but they haven't been that bad. I think, I think they would be a lot harder if it was more like a 
think the thing that really sinks a lot of bands is sort of like a fight for creative control. Yes. You know, and uh, we kind of dealt with that sort of stuff pretty early on. It was like, we were all so young, you know, I think my advice to any musicians is like, you know, to younger musicians is just to start really young. Like, the younger you start, the better, because otherwise you end up hashing out all that hard stuff when you're way too old to be doing it. That's it, man. There's too much crap to get out of the way in the first 10 years, so you might as well do it when you have no standards whatsoever. Yeah, and when you have a lot of energy. Yes. You know what I mean? You're like, I have energy to play this show, like sleep on a floor where like a dog keeps waking me up and wake (laughs) up and like have a fight with you in the van, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So how did that, I think um, uh, one of my favorite albums of yours is the Buddy Miller produced I'm a Stranger Here. Um, Oh, I love that record. How did that... Talk to me about how that creative process worked through the lens of working with him, and and tell me a few stories of working with Buddy Miller. I, I really admire that guy. Yeah, man, it was great. Uh, we we got hooked up with Buddy um, through our manager at the time, and and he, you know, we we really liked the sounds of his records. You know, like he's got just really really great sounds and that sort of real rough sound that I really like a lot. Um, probably from listening to a lot of like. Uh, chess records era blues stuff uh-huh. um, which was huge for me like big inspiration and uh, yeah we I went to Nashville to meet with Buddy and he's just like a man he was such a like a real calm kind of presence to have in the studio you know it was uh, his approach to producing is kind of like it's almost like he's a member of the band mm-hmm. he just like joins the band and he's got ideas, you know, and he plays with you and he's got ideas for what you could do. He's not heavy handed. You know what I mean? He's not like, this is what I want this to be. He sort of like approaches it like, well, what would it be like if I was in the band? <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool, I've never heard uh, uh, of a style like that before. So he, you guys would just start playing and he would look around the room at all the various different instruments that he plays, pick one up and try to try to fit in. He would do that. He would be like, I want to play on this song, but also he would kind of be like a coach. And he would be like, what do you think about adding this here? Like, I have this friend that I think we should come and have in the studio, and he's going to, we're going to like, you know, put on a percussion part here. And it was kind of like the merging of our group with his. Got it. You know what I mean? He was like, I've got people that I think would be really cool on this, and I think we should call them. And then we would. And then he would sit in on some songs. And, you know, and also he was very into us all recording live, um, which was a lot of fun. And he, he used some, like, recording techniques that I was like, wow, I never would have thought of that. Like what? Um, well, one thing he did, which is, I mean, this is where, you know, people who (laughs) aren't into recording totally don't know what the hell we're talking about, but (laughs) basically he would do, when we were doing overdubs for say a, uh, a lead part, the whole band would do it. And so the person would play through and if they didn't really feel like they got it, they'd be like, do it again. And we would just count in listening to the track. Yeah. Like one, two, three, four, punch, and then they do the solo again. We never, they never played over not a live track. Man, you know, it's. Re- I just made my first record in Nashville, uh, this last one, at, and we didn't do any overdubs like that. But one of the things that we did that I'd never seen before, the producer uh, Kenneth was really into this live sound, and you're working with these musicians who are just a- another level of uh, of talented and. Uh, so instead of doing punches, what we would do is we'd do a bunch of takes, and then we weren't playing to a click, and they were able to comp together different sections of these takes. We weren't playing to a click, and so there's comps of whole sections, and you would never know it listening to the record. Yeah, well, that's exactly how I felt. I was amazed. We weren't playing to a click either. You know, and it was just kind of like with the with the whole, with everybody playing together and the sort of feel of it, it worked perfectly. And I think it gives, it also, I don't know, you know, I I feel like it's easy sometimes for, you know, for you to hear, if you are a musician, you're sort of hearing like, oh, well, that's that's just like an overdub. You know what I mean? (laughs) Right. Uh, I mean, not that that's a bad thing. Sometimes it sounds great, but you can tell. 
and uh, it sort of made sure that that wasn't going to happen, and uh, it gave the record a really, I don't know, I think a really live feel. I loved it. Well, yeah, and, and you guys are, like, by definition, a live band, so it, it really played to the strengths of what you are and what you've always been. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, it was, and it was a lot of fun to make too. We had a blast making it, and uh, yeah, and I really, I really like Buddy as a guy, and um, and his his music as well. And like, it was just, it was, it was a really great collaboration. Talk to me about how your songwriting process has evolved. Just you and your own, not with uh, the band. How that has evolved from you know, about 20 years ago to now, do things still look pretty similar when you try to start a song and write it? Or have you evolved and, and brought in different methods? Um, I'd say it looks the same on the outside, but it's not. Uh, you know, I think over the years, you know, what I've always done is to start just sort of with stream of consciousness, just saying whatever. Sometimes I don't even say anything. Sometimes I'm not even saying words. But just to sort of get like a feel for what I want to do. And now, though, I mean, early on, I think everything that I came out with ended up in the song, you know, mm. like, especially when I was a teenager, you know, I mean, like everything, everything went on the page, everything, every riff, every word. Um, and now I am way heavier handed on the editing side. Yeah. I just sort of want to say more with less. And uh, so that's how it's changed more than anything else. I think, you know, early on, I was just like machine gun, you know, and, uh, now I'm way more, I don't know, you know, I'm just like, that is something I don't need to say. Sometimes you can get so much across by what you don't say. Yeah, you really can. And where you can notice that the most is as you're listening to other people's music and you're seeing the pictures that it's painting in your mind and you're like, Oh, I'm actually as a listener doing a lot of heavy lifting here. You know yeah, I mean? you're doing all the you're doing all the work, really. You know, they they're like building like a like a blueprint. You know, yes, yeah. And you sort of build the house. I mean, that's and that's the kind of songwriting that I've always really loved. You know, it's like they're just giving you the bare bones, and you do the rest. And conversely, when you give a listener too much, I think, or or as a listener, I feel this. When I'm given too much as a listener, I almost like tune out because there's no work. For me to do, there's there's no putting together. It's too on the nose. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's sort of all spelled out for you, and I mean, especially too when it's sort of almost like directions. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I've never really liked that, where it's like it's almost like you know everything is there, like you're saying, like what you're supposed to think and what the character thinks and everything. You know, nothing's left to the imagination. And yeah, I mean, I I tune out on that too. I think everybody does. Yeah, it, it 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 almost feels like when you're listening to a song like that, you feel like the writer had some sort of agenda, and it's like I don't think that's what art. To me, that's not what art is. Art is the artist and the listener, or you know, the viewer, whoever's beholding the art, discovering at the same time what's being said. You know. Yeah, and it also, I mean, the great thing about it is that it means different things for different people. Yes. You know, it's like if you take that away from them, I mean, then it's sort of like not letting it be what it could be. You know, it's like, I think, you know, that's the great thing about songs. You know, I've listened to songs. I know they're so meaningful to me in this certain way. And I know to somebody else, it's completely different. You know, I mean, sure. they're still meaningful to them, but for completely different reasons. I mean, that's, that's great songwriting. You know, I've had... I've listened to Willie Nelson songs. I remember just like listening. I listened so much to these Willie Nelson demos he did early on. And I remember listening for like the, you know, I don't know how many times I've listened, the hundredth time. Mm -hmm. And being like, wow, this is a really angry song. <laughs> it always sounded kind of like nostalgic and sort of like, you know, sad. Yeah. But like on the hundredth time or the hundred and fifty time, the hundred and fiftieth time I was like, Oh, wow, this is like the most pissed off song I've ever heard. But it's very, very subtle. It is. Well and he I don't think you could have brought up a better example of of someone who lets you hang your own details inside of a song. I mean, his are yeah. wide open. They're wide open. Yep. He's a master, you know, and that, that's, I mean, it's always amazing to, yeah, being like, huh, I listened to this song so many times, now I'm getting this totally different meaning, which I think might have been what he actually meant. It's just that you have to really look for it, 
You know, it's like, it's not, he's not doing all the work for you. It's like, how hard do you want to listen? Exactly. I mean, when you hear something like, walking is better than running away and crawling ain't no good at all. I mean, I don't need to hear about the breakup. I don't need to hear about the, you know, the the machinations of how it went down. I don't need to hear about how someone cheated on someone. Like, it says it all right there, and, and, and I'm yeah. able to see the scene. That's the great thing about poetry, you yeah. know what I mean? It's, that's, it's, it's the great thing about it, and it's it's like the highest use of the language, you know? You can say so many things and you know, without hardly saying anything at all. <laughs> that's it. Do you find yourself... Are you the type of writer that always kind of has a guitar handy and when inspiration strikes, you pick it up? Or do you set aside time to sit down and work and maybe something comes, maybe something doesn't? I don't really set aside time to work. I used to, but now I really feel like, now my feeling is that I have no idea when it's going to hit me. Yeah. And um, I do think you do have to set aside time. You have to have time in your life or else there will be no inspiration to hit you. But at the same time, I know that I can't force it. It's like I've tried, you know, to be sitting out like I want to write an album. I'm sitting down with the intention of writing an album. I mean, I can write some stuff, but it's not anything that I like. And then there's other times where I could write all night. Right. You said that you that your life has to be set up in a way where you, there is time set aside to do it if you need to. How do you set up your life in a way that you're able to be there for, for lack of a better term, the muse when it strikes? Well, I mean, I think, I guess you have to have that, that freedom in your life, or if you can't have the freedom, you do actually have to set aside time. I mean, when I've been really busy, it's like, I will set aside like an hour or two to play, and if nothing happens, then nothing happens, you know? And um, in the past, when I really wanted to write, too, I've been as, like, hardcore as basically going like i'm gonna go into this room and if i can't write anything that's fine but i'm not coming out for like three hours you know that's yeah i i just read that when john prime was writing his last record his his family had encouraged him to write another record and he was just kind of like ah i've said everything i need to say but they prevailed upon him to do it and they said that they just dropped him off at a hotel in downtown nashville at like the omni and brought him some groceries and just kind of like locked him in there for a week that's exactly what I, that's like an act of desperation, but I've done the same thing. Sure. sure. And I think that when you do that, mm-hmm. um, when you do that, something will come. You know what I mean? Like yes. my, my feeling about inspiration is like, if you don't make that space, it's totally impossible. Right. But sometimes you make that space and it's also totally impossible. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. Fair enough. Um, well, talk to me a little bit about, I know that you're, you're getting ready to release a, a solo record. This isn't your first solo record, but it is your most uh, recent. What inspired making this yourself and, and without the band? Well, I mean, you know, partially, <laughs> partially it had to do with um, uh, just basically we don't live all, we don't all live in the same place. So that's a, you know, like we were talking about before, that's just sort of a, a reality of, of getting older is, you know, we don't live in the same spot. So uh, playing music, you know, together uh, spontaneously can be difficult. Mm-hmm. And when I was sort of home, you know, and just, uh, you know, writing and playing, um, I just came up with a with a bunch of songs. And actually, during that time, I did sort of what we were talking about, where uh, something I've never done before, where I went, I went to my friend's studio here in Vermont, and I was just sort of like, well... I want to record some songs. I don't exactly know what they are, but I'm going to make the time and Mm -hmm. they will come, you know, and I just went to the studio every day. It's something I've never done before. It was, um, it was really, really fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's definitely like an element of like, uh Oh, I hope I come up with something today, (laughs) Right, right. but it was also created that pressure. Yep. You know, I was like, wow, I'm going in the studio tomorrow. Like I got to get together, you know? And um, that that led to me making the solo record, and I sort of had it, I had the songs recorded, and I was like, well, I'll get to that. You know, I've always wanted to do um, a solo tour. Uh, you know, I've, I've done it before in the past, like you said. And then, the, the, you know, the, this uh, whole health crisis thing happened, and I was like, well, I guess this would be a time when I could finish that project. <laughs> Totally. totally. Yeah. So I mean, that it kind of gave me the gave me the space. Normally, I think I would really struggle to find the time. Mm. 
Well, that's exciting stuff. Uh, Pete, it's great to hear your voice, man. It's been too long. And um, thanks for sitting down with our program today. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, man, no problem. It's great. Great to talk to you. And uh, I hope that, I mean, I hope we do meet someday down the road. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Stay safe. All right, cool. Take care of yourself. Bye. You too. Bye. That's our show for this week. Thanks for joining us. It was brought to you by Banzoogle, built by musicians and for musicians. Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Pete's latest album is entitled Harmony Ascension Division, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write... Please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.